Good morning, Petal Harvey. We are the Wong family. In just a moment, we'll begin worship. Please press pause on your device and pray. When you finish, we'll begin worship. Hope to see you soon. Oh, how 
Amen. That was good music. And uh, listen, we always appreciate you participating in singing like you did this morning. As you're being seated, take your Bible and turn with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Our time in the Bible this week has dropped us off right in the middle of the Bible uh, in the book of Psalms. It's dropped us off even in this week in the middle of the longest chapter of the entire Bible, which is Psalm 119. Uh, the question you have to ask it when you begin this book, though, is what exactly is a psalm? A psalm is probably something that began as a prayer that was prayed, which then became a song that you sang, and then eventually became recorded scripture uh, inspired through the Spirit. And this is what people used when they went to worship services. So when we open the book of Psalms, what we're finding is the lyrics for the songs that people like David and Daniel and even our Lord Jesus used whenever they went to worship. This is an entire book that really is meant to give us a God-centered view of reality. Now, here's what that means. It, it means that when you read this book, it's going to tell you with great comfort that you can bring all of your emotions to the table. You can bring your troubles and your anguish and your suffering and your highs and your lows and your successes and your defeats and your faith and even your doubts. And what Psalms is going to tell us is that there is room for all of those emotions and experiences inside a relationship with God. Now sometimes you'll read through these psalms and sometimes they are loud with the noise of battle. And then sometimes they're going to draw you off to a quiet corner with just the whisper of God. Sometimes these psalms are going to light our hearts on fire. They're going, to, they're, they're going to cause us to want to dance. Well, we're Baptists, so we don't dance, but we get really excited, you know. And then there are other times where uh, these psalms are going to really just intend to bring hope to moments of despair. It may be that when you read your Bible... There is no other place in all of the Bible where perhaps every emotional condition of your heart can be better expressed than the book of Psalms. Others do it great in other places in the Bible, but the Psalms seems to take all of our feelings in one book and give us an expression that God is listening. What I think is, uh, is, is always important is uh, the name behind all of these things. All throughout this book, you're going to hear about the Lord. The most famous uh, probably chapter in the whole book of Psalms is Psalm chapter 23. And you're going to hear it like this. It'll say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm chapter 18 is going to say, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Psalm chapter 27 is going to say that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? But when you see the word Lord here in the Bible, particularly in the book of Psalms, what you're getting is the translation of the name that God gave Moses on the mountain. It's the name Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of God. My name is Dusty. You, uh, your parents gave you a name. God's given name is Yahweh. It's a Hebrew word that roughly translates to mean I am that I am. I am and I cause to be. I am and I do. And so all throughout the book of Psalms, what you're going to find is that you're going to find a lot of descriptors of God. And although we can describe Him in wonderful ways and tailor make those ways even to our situations, He can be our physician, our helper, our shepherd, our hero, our rock, our refuge. We can give a lot of descriptors about God, but what you're going to find is on the days when you really hit those troubled patches, you don't need a description about God, you need God. And so what the book of Psalms is going to remind us is the, the big picture here is that we, what we really need is, is, is a Yahweh, and we have one. I think that probably the bigger picture of Psalms is a, is a slowing down realization of what really matters in life. Most of the times in our lives, we typically run through this world barely noticing each moment. We got faces buried in our screens. We're scrolling through content where one picture absolutely replaces another almost at just at lightning speed. And yet Psalms is telling us to slow down because we have a Lord. 
And he's telling us what kind of Lord we have. And it's not the Lord that grabs our attention momentarily satisfying some need for more more data. This is the kind of Lord who is the eternal, always, ever-sufficient God. Psalm 19 is this longest chapter of the Bible. We've we've read it in its entirety this week. But I I want us to just uh, pause and to read perhaps the, the smallest little piece but the most famous piece of this psalm together. We'll begin Psalm 119, reading in verse 105. Here's what the Bible says. The Scripture says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, I pray, the freewill offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your judgments. My life is continually in my hand, and yet I do not forget your word. The wicked have laid up a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your precepts. Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever. To the very end. So uh, when we read this psalm, there's, there's a lot that really jumps off the page. What I'm interested in is really h- how it ends here. Even in our time begins, uh, the ending here is important. It says, for they are rejoicing to my heart. And then verse 112 says, I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes. Here's what that means. That means that if I'm going to follow what God wants me to follow in my life, if I'm going to do what I need to do and be what I need to be and grow the way I need to grow, the direction I point my heart in matters. And when I read that, I, I think it very much has language, very much like a wedding ceremony. Like the moment where a bride and her groom, they stand together, they look together, and they make vows. You know what those vows really are? They are inclining the affections of their heart towards a common goal, unity and faithfulness. And so what the psalmist is saying is, if we want the marriage to be good, we make our intentions known at the wedding. If we want the journey to be right, we, we, have a, we have a great beginning to the journey. That's, I think that's where it's going. Now, so much of the 175 verses of this psalm, and listen, I know in your readings this week, that was a, that's a big chunk to take over a couple of days. As we've read it through, what it's really telling us is how very precious and timely the Word of God is in our lives. And what it's really saying is that, that God's Word is more than something written. It's His voice. He doesn't take his word here in the, in the Bible, and he doesn't roll out the, our lives like a map. You know why I don't think he does that? God, God rarely gives us every, if ever, uh, gives us every step of the journey we're going to take in life. You know what? Personally, I'm glad that he doesn't because it'd be terrifying. Are you the kind of person that, uh, that can get 20 compliments about something and people can be nice and they can be expressive and it makes you feel good, it makes your heart warm, it, you, you're excited that people are affirming that thing in your life, but you can take one criticism and all of a sudden the one criticism takes precedent over the 20 compliments and will take the one bad thing over the 20 good things, and the one bad thing gets all of our attention, and we overanalyze, and we overthink, and that one thing can ruin the 20. It's interesting how the one can overcome the 20, when it ought to be that the 20 can overshadow the one. I think oftentimes there's reasons why we find in the Scripture that God does not give us every detail of the journey before we get there. Number one is this, we're supposed to be people who walk by faith and not by sight. The other thing is, I know that I'm prone to take the one over the 20. And if he showed me the one hard moment of the next 20 years of good, I would overanalyze the one and worry about the one and I'd miss the beauty of the 20. So what the Lord does instead here is he takes the journey piece by piece. And he doesn't tell us every twist and every, and every turn of the journey. But I will tell you what he does tell us. He tells us who we are and he tells us who our father is. And he believes that that information is enough. 
See, over and over again, we're going to experience the, the, the eventually sobering truth that medicine will fail us, that jobs will fail us, that money will fail us, that people will fail us. But the other realization is that God will never fail us. Verse number 111, let's look at it together. It says, Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Now this whole section of verses is really describing the voice of God using a bunch of different words really to communicate the same idea. It, it, is, it is overproducing so that we can, we can grab hold of at least one of them. So here in the passage it's describing things like his, it's calling it his word in verse number 105. It's his judgment in verse 106. Then it's his law and his statutes. But here in verse 111, it's his testimonies. So what is that? The word for testimonies here in your Bible is, a, uh, is translated from a Hebrew word. The whole Bible, the whole Old Testament's in Hebrew. Uh, and this is a word that's a, it's a feminine word. It's a soothing word. The idea of the testimony here as it, as it describes God's word is less of a stop sign that you don't see and that you come up on and as soon as you see it, you got to lock the brakes up and you skid to a stop in order to keep it. That, that's not what it's talking about here. Instead, this is a soothing moment where a father takes a child and puts his arm around the child and he gives life wisdom to somebody he loves. This is compassionate language and advice for life. I like, the way, I like the way it does that. Ultimately, what the psalmist is saying here is that he's come to the conclusion in his own life that God may do his deepest works in our darkest hours. Now, that's important for us, but I don't want us to miss, I think, the most important word of that verse. Let me read it and see if you catch it real quick. Verse 111 says it again. Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Can I, can I tell you, I think the most important word in that verse is the word forever. Because it's one thing to say that I'm going to follow what God says. I'm going to be faithful to what God wants. I'm going to be obedient to his ways. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you when it's easy to do those things, when we already agree. It is absolutely no trouble, no sweat off my back if my will happens to coincide with God's will. If what he says is something I already want to do, I already agree with, I already want to take part in, and I already believe that's the right path, then following what God says is, no, is, is not hard at all because I already want to. But the word forever changes everything. It says that in spite of what I want and what I feel and what I think and how I, how I wish I could respond, I will forever, in all cases, in all moments, at all times, be obedient to the Lord. That no matter what I think, His thoughts will carry more weight in my life. No matter what I want, His, His commands will hold more authority. No matter where I disagree, I am merely the servant while He is truly the master. And, and here's what we all know. Every single one of us knows that when we're born, we're born looking like our parents. But when we die, we'll die looking like our choices. So that means that the guidance we take in life that motivates those choices, it better come from the right place. What I appreciate here is that none of these expectations from God and his word ever happen in a vacuum of perfection. Why? Because life is never going to be perfect. I think that some people have the idea that the commands of God, they're great ideas, they're wonderful expectations, and let's take a piece of driftwood and write a verse on it and paint it over and put it on our mantle, and we're going we're gonna to have his word all over our homes. But then when trouble hits and turmoil strikes and, and things get dark and difficult, most people have the idea that verses like that are good to have on good days. But when trouble strikes, it's no holds barred. We just got to we just got to do what we got to do. The Lord will forgive me later. This is what I think I need to do. Well, how does a king who asks us to serve him and love him and follow him forever, 
how does that coincide with the commitment we made when we got saved? It says, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I, I've been bought with a price, therefore I'm no longer my own. I, I'm, I belong to Jesus. What, what, kind of, what kind of precedence does that set for the people that know that we're followers of Jesus, to know that when life gets hard, we don't follow Jesus the way they don't follow Jesus? Can I tell you this? It, it's easy whenever you look at life, it's easy not to get discouraged for me when I see sinners acting like sinners. I expect lions to roar and cheetahs to run and kangaroos to jump. I expect that. You know what? Because it's, it's their nature. And when sinners sin, it's to be expected. But when disciples refuse to obey, it goes against nature. So the idea that I would, I, I would take the commands of God and I, I, would, I would treat them as if they're important when they don't matter, when, I, when everything's good but not follow them when, I, when man, it really gets difficult, it's crazy. I appreciate that none of this happens in the vacuum of perfection. If, if anything, what we read in this passage is that the author is saying that in life, you better expect some hard moments. The author goes through, he says in verse 107, he says, I am afflicted very, very much. Well, what's that, what's that mean? Evidently, he's feeling what you and I already know, that godly living is not always going to be easy. It's not always the simple choice, and sometimes it's the most, uh, it's the most mature thing you can do in the most immature of situations. Just obey the Lord. In verse number 109, he says, my, my life is continually in my hand. You know what that means? He's saying that he feels like his life is continually at risk. He's always vulnerable. He's in jeopardy at all times. His life literally could uh, expire at any moment. I like the way Charles Spurgeon said it years ago. He said that the man who carries his life in his hands ought to be wise enough to carry the law of God in his heart because he's going to need it. Verse number 110, it even gets to the interpersonal side of life. Verse 110 said, The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not, I have not strayed from your precepts. Evidently, this author ha has gathered together a great number of very powerful and very influential enemies. And you want to think, you want to, you want to assume that these people in the Bible live these picturesque kind of lives where nothing ever bad happened and they never struggled and they never worried and they always had faith and they always believed and, and they never. Never stepped out. Listen, these folks lived real lives. That's why God gives us their stories. There is no perfect person in this Bible aside from the Lord Jesus. And even his life had disciples who betrayed him, people who arrested him without cause and killed him without reason. Life will have trouble. So what's the constant? If on one side the constant is, in this world you will have trouble, the other constant we have here is, you have a God who loves you, will never leave you nor forsake you, and he's got a standard for how you're to live your life. And if you follow it, you'll walk with him through it. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is, is uh, the occasions when those disciples would be in the boat and a storm would whip up and, and they would call to Jesus and say, Jesus, uh, save us from this storm. And he would, he'd walk out and he'd look at wind and waves and he'd either be walking toward them on the water or he'd step out on the bow of the ship and he, he'd calm those storms with just a voice. It's interesting to me when I read those stories how they're, how they're put out there because they feel real. You say, how, how does it feel real where somebody's walking on water or commanding storms to pass? Well, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. That's certainly real. But what feels real to me is that just because Jesus was in the boat or coming toward the boat, it did not mean that there was no storm. It just meant that they had help through the storm. See, the, the word and obeying the word and following the, the voice of the Lord does not give us the right to treat life like if I have a bad day, if I have a bad problem, that God has somehow abandoned me and life is now unfair. It's not. 
Listen, every time something bad happens, it's, it's not, it may not always be because you've sinned some great sin or even spiritual warfare. Don't get a flat tire or let the dishwasher break and say, oh, the devil's really after me. No, you know what it means? It means you had an old dishwasher and it needs to get fixed. But I tell you what it does mean. If it is the tire or the dishwasher or the storm or the problem or the bad diagnosis, there is an eternal God who was there before. He is here now, and he'll be there tomorrow. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And sometimes that path needs that light because it goes through some pretty dark valleys. The nature of God's voice and all of these ups and downs of life, they're meant to give us hope. That's what I think it means at the end of verse number 111 where it says this, For they are the rejoicing of my heart. You see, there's a beauty that says, even if nothing ever gets back to normal, and even if going backwards is not an option, we have a God who is powerful enough to keep moving us forward. We are then further assured that we are known We are loved and we are wanted by the most important person in the whole universe. And that he takes great delight in linking his power with our weakness and preserving our lives through troubled times. You know when you learn that? You learn that in troubled times. You learn it on days when all you've got is the comfort of God because everything else has come crashing down. You learn it on the days when you don't, you don't feel like you've got anybody else to talk to and nothing else to, to look forward to and everything feels bad and everything hurts and everything is, is despair. You learn who God is in those moments. When you sit down with his word at your breakfast table and, and you don't set up a, 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 a beautiful picture moment where you take 20 minutes arranging your Bible with your coffee cup and the sunrise in the distance. Listen, my best quiet times never look good on Instagram. As a matter of fact, they feel terrible when I start because I need You learn who God is on tough days. When you have to open your Bible because it is the only food that can fill you. It is the only drink that can nourish you. It is what keeps you going. And here's the deal. There will be many people who will never learn God that way. Because they'll spend all of their lives trying to avoid pain at all costs. I'm going to tell you something else. Every mature believer I've ever met, They've already been through that. And that's probably why they're mature. Let's end where it starts. Look in verse number 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, when you and I read this word, or this, the beginning of this phrase, that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light into my path, I'm not sure if we always visualize that correctly. In our minds, in our world, a lamp is something that sits on an end table and you turn it on and it gives light to the whole room and and it's just another accenting piece of decoration that gives a little bit of light in the corner of the room. But that's not what it's talking about here. Here what the scripture is talking about, that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The kind of lamp that's described here is a, is a little clay pot filled with oil with a little cloth wick at the very end of it lit on fire. And it's, a, it's, it's called a foot lamp. It has the ability to put out about as much light as about one small candle. And the idea was this is what you picked up in the night when you had to walk around the house or you had to, you had to walk down the path somewhere in the dark. It's a foot lamp. It doesn't give light to all the things around it. It only gives light to the next step. And piece by piece, you carry this light with you. And step by step, it lights the way. It's only got enough light for the one step. You could make an entire journey with it, but you got to keep referring back to that one light for every single step. And that's what the Scripture does. While the world cherishes results, the Word of God is going to emphasize the process. 
And then we get to the, this piece where it says, you're not just a lamp unto my feet, you're a light unto my path. What's happening with this passage is it, the light described here is altogether different from the first one. Where the first one was a little lamp that gave you enough light for one step. This light unto my path is the bigger light. This is the blinding, all-consuming, dawn of the day, blinding, pure light. This is the light at the beginning of all creation when God steps out of nowhere onto nothing and says, and says let there be light. This is the kind of light that it's talking about. See, God's word here is now both kinds of light. It's the blinding light of the sun that pushes away all darkness. One light to, to push all darkness away. It is the one shining light, but it's also the small, personal, individual, step-by-step -step guidance we need every moment, moment by moment. Now, I want to remind you of something here. I've told you, I can't tell you how many times now. You, you're probably getting tired of hearing me say this. Every single chapter with every single verse and every story on every page and every page and every book of the Old Testament is pushing us to the arrival of someone, something better in the New Testament. Obviously, it's the arrival of the Lord Jesus. And we've, if we believe that about all these other stories we read in the Old Testament, then surely that's got to be true about this moment as well. And it is. Here's how we know. In the book of John in the New Testament, John chapter 1 verse 1 says it like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what's that have to do with the whole thing? Well, your Word is a lamp unto my feet. Later in the book of John, Jesus is going to say this. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. So here Jesus is both the word and the light. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. And so even in Psalm 119, the intent of the Bible is still that every man's journey eventually takes him to the place where he has to decide what he's going to do with Jesus. Now let me ask you this. Do you know Jesus yet? Has there ever been a time in your life where you surrendered your will and your ways to Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh and the light of the world? Has there ever been a moment in your life where you turned from your sins and you placed your faith in Jesus where you gave complete control of his life, of your life to him. I wonder this. Most of us are guilty with being ready to give God our little bit or our sum. But have you ever given Jesus your all? Jesus, here's all of me. Maybe you say, Pastor, I, I've never done that, but I'd like to. In just a moment, at the very bottom of the screen, you're going to see that all familiar email address. My next step phbc at gmail.com. If you're ready to talk with somebody about uh, asking Jesus to be your Savior, can I talk with you today? If you'll email me today, listen, I'll get back with you quick, and let's talk about it. Now let's do what we do in church. Every head bowed and every eye closed. It may be that you've already given Jesus your life. You've already been saved. You already know him as the Savior of your soul. But let me ask you this. If you already know that, is there any part of your life that you're living right now that's in direct contradiction to his word? He has said something. He's commanded something. He's pushing something here in the scripture. And, and, and you're not on board with it. What if today you decided, you know, a servant is not greater than his master. It's enough for a servant to be like his master. I said, Jesus, you're the master. I'm the servant. I put all of my life under your authority. Or maybe you're watching this morning and uh, you've never trusted Jesus to be your savior, but you'd like to. Maybe right there in your living room with every head bowed and every eye closed, you'd like to ask Jesus to be your savior. I'd like to help you with that. In just a moment, I'm going to pray, and there's nothing special about this particular, these particular words that I'm going to use. This is just what I would say if I was sitting where you are and I wanted to be saved. I'd pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you're the Savior of the world, 
that you're God's son, that you died for me on the cross as the sacrifice for my sin, and that you resurrected to life after three days. I ask you today to come live inside of me, wash away my sins. And as I repent and turn away from my sins, I ask you to be my Lord, you to be my Savior. And Father, when I die, take my soul to heaven. I wonder this morning, did you pray that prayer this morning? Pray something like that? Did you give your heart to Jesus and and you need to tell somebody? i tell you what you can do. You can tell somebody in your living room right now. But I'd also like it if you'd let me know. And let's let's begin a conversation on what you do next. Email me today at mynextstepphbc at gmail.com. I'd love for us to have a conversation about this. Additionally, in just a moment after we pray, you're going to find online uh, the, the questions based from the message today. Spend some time talking with your family about that before you go to Bible study online today. Listen, we love you. We hope to see you soon. Let's pray as we dismiss. Father, we love you. We pray that this week we would live that uh, live in a way where your word is the lamp that we guide every step by. And Father, your word is the light that, that gives hope in our dark moments. And that, Father, we... We walk in the light as you're in the light. Lord, help us this week to be faithful followers of Jesus. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Have a great Sunday. We hope to see you soon.